All right, guys. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing today? Oh, yeah. Let's do it one more time. How's everyone doing this afternoon? Well, hey, man. Well, as you guys are continuing to find your seats and give your last hugs, uh, there's going to be many and plenty times to fellowship because today is a fantastic day. All right. This week is Holy Week as we're following Easter. So if everyone should know that today is Palm Sunday. Everyone say Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Let's get it one more time. Everyone say Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Well, amen. You know, this day really is an image of Jesus coming to Jerusalem on a donkey, right? It's not necessarily a hero's or a king's welcome, but people in Jerusalem knew exactly who they were looking at, which was Jesus, right? The true king. And so everyone, everyone just focus on this uh, passage as I say it in Luke 19, verse 37 to 38. And it has something to do with this song that we're going to sing, which is Blessed Be Your Name. But in Luke 19, 37 to 38, if you guys, can, you guys can listen right here, it says, When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had done. They had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And so I want you guys to kind of imagine that picture, right? That as Jesus was going down and they were placing all these palm tree, palm leaves, right? As we say Palm Sunday, right? They're saying, Blessed is the name that is the Lord Jesus. Right, So, so they, they saw Jesus as their true king. So for the rest of uh, our time here as we sing songs and even as Scott comes up to preach a powerful lesson, I want you guys to imagine what Palm Sunday is all about. It's recognizing Jesus as the true king. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing, Blessed Be Your Name. Start off with the line, blessed be your name. Okay. Check it out. Blessed be your name in the land that is planned. Sing it out. Where your stream? Where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Sing it out to God, amen. Blessed be your name.
sound. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. may be seated. Good evening, Desert City Church of Christ. My name is Donald Boyd. This is my beautiful wife, Paige Boyd. <laughs> and today I'm gonna be doing the welcoming and everything. <laughs> All right, so today I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, what I've been going through for a while and how God's been there for me and through prayer and through my brothers and sisters that he put in my life to help me when I have struggles and everything with myself and my marriage trying to be like my brothers you know OG brothers that's been married for a while <laughs> so I, um, I was reading through Psalms the you know Psalms is for all the songs and all that in the Bible and uh, I was reading Psalms 94 verse 19 and it says, in the multitudes of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. Yes. And like whenever I'm feeling stressed, I, I, I look to God, do a little prayer to him. Whenever I pray, I feel better and I can deal with the day. So just want to do a little prayer for everybody. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for our family, thank you for the love and the grace and the comfort that you bring in our life. Lord, I ask you to cover everyone in here with your blood. Lord, keep us safe and can't wait to hear the beautiful words you have today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, let's stand on up as we continue worshiping God. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 11, uh, Scripture reads, By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so we're going to sing this song, Build My Life. And the song is all about this re thinking of what are we building our life with. And this song is a, is a declaration to Jesus that we're going to build our lives on him, right? And so as we sing this song, you guys can um, sing it out loud, or you guys can take this time to pray, worship however you guys want to worship. But think, think about the ways or the things that you have built your life on this past week, what kind of foundations you've built, whether it's stress from your work or stress from your family or you laid, your, laid down your foundation in things that are not as secure as Jesus. And maybe reflect on that. And really this song is about redeclaring that I will build my life on what is stable, which is Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we're going to sing Build My Life.
there is none beside you open up my eyes and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me lead you back to those around me beautiful worthy of every song
sing How Great Is Our God. And we're going to sing it in Spanish because how amazing it is that we can uh, glorify God in different languages. Thinking about, right, that all over the world, that even on this day, right, people are glorifying God in their own language, glorifying God and, and saying the name Jesus and uh, or glorifying Jesus in different ways, amen. So we're going to sing How Great Is Our God as we continue worshiping together.
So now is the time in our service when we talk about the weekly offering. I was watching a clip on YouTube earlier this week, and it was a program that took place in England in the 1800s. And there was this very nicely dressed young couple walking out in the woods, or whatever they call it in England. And they were not being careful, so they both ended up following, falling into this big mud puddle. And that was kind of the scene. When I read the comments under that scene, people were saying, oh, that was really cute, or how charming, or how romantic. But one very practically minded person pointed out how hard it was going to be to get all that mud out of that young lady's dress. <laughs> I don't think about those sorts of things when I watch these period piece programs or movies, but that commentator was right. It's not like that young lady could just throw that dress into a washing machine or go to the dry cleaners. She probably had servants who had to boil individual pots of water, put them in a big tub, take some big stick with some lye maybe, and painstakingly clean it. And then once they cleaned it, they had to figure out how to dry it and press it without any electricity. Everyday things were really hard back in those times. Consider even making an offering back in the Old Testament times. Today, I have mine set up as recurring monthly withdrawal. So I don't even know that it happens except I get an email that told me that my offering was made. But back then, like even to do just a grain offering, you had to bring a loaf of bread to be burned, part of it on the altar. You know, so I could probably bring a couple of loaves of bread to church with me. That's not too complicated. But then you had the burn offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. And those required a bull, a bird, a ram, or a goat. And I think my drive here today would have been a lot harder if I had a goat and a couple of doves in the car with me. <laughs> Not only that, the animals had to be without defects, so that added to all the prep time that you had to do to get your offering ready. Roy led us in that song, Blessed Be Your Name, earlier, and it talks about so there's pain in the offering, and those Old Testament givers definitely knew about that pain. But the upside of that pain was that they had many points in time when they had to think about what they were doing and why they were doing it. Compare, compare that to me where I don't do anything. I barely even know my contribution is made. They had to toil and sweat in order to make their offering. So my challenge, and maybe it's your challenge too, is to find ways to stay spiritually connected to our offering so that we don't lose sight of why we do it. God leaves that each to, up to each one of us to figure out how to do that. Maybe for you, it's doing a topical Bible study on giving to really get your heart committed to it. Maybe it's doing some prayer time on Sunday where you really pray through your offering and things that you'd like to see God do with your offering. But the important thing is that we do something to stay connected. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13 reads, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that have been taught. For sure, what we don't want to happen is that we do things mechanically with God and without any heart behind it. So let's take time this coming week to really focus on connecting with our offering and whatever way works best for you. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time where we can just focus on your offering. I know with my schedule, God, and I'm sure everyone else in this room, there's such a hustle bustle nowadays, God, just to get everything done that we need to get done. But it's important, God, that we take time to slow down and to really think about the things that are important, like our offering to you, God. Thank you for blessing this offering, and we ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So some announcements today. Easter service next Sunday, same time here at St. John's, but there will be an Easter egg hunt afterwards. Parents, please bring a dozen filled eggs per kid. 
no chocolate or nuts, please. There will be a blood drive at uh, here, also on Thursday, April 14th, from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you'd like to sign up to donate, please go online at www.lstream.org to sign up for a time. We're also looking for people who want to join the worship team. So if you have a voice that, that Rory would like and God would like, or if you play, a, yeah, he says anybody's fine at this point. Or, or if you want to play, if you play an instrument, he'd like to talk with you after service or please give him a call during the week. And finally, we have our great father-daughter dance on May 21st. It's from 7 to 10 p.m. It's in our beautiful outdoor pavilion at St. John's, $10 per person. All ages are welcome. Please register at iechurch.com. And Josh, if you could show the, QVC, uh, the QR code in case someone wants to take a picture of it, that'll take you to the sign-up page if you take a picture of it with your phone. That's the announcements. Thank you. Amen. Let's stand on up for one uh, more song until we have uh, Scott come up and preach the word. You know, getting to know Scott kind of the past couple of years, I know that he likes to, he likes a little hype before he gets up to kind of get his blood flowing, getting ready to preach the word. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. I want you guys to give me just your loudest. But are you guys ready to hear the word being preached? Are you guys ready to hear from Scott Sweeney? Hey Amen. Now, Scott's man, I, I really need to kill this lesson to make sure I go in that hype right. But hey amen. But this service is all about, it's still all about Jesus and remembering Jesus and, how, and that he is king, right? So we're going to sing Holy is the Lord.
You guys may be seated. All right, well, it's good to be together here today. Roy, man, you embarrassed me there before that. That was, I was like, man, he caught me totally off guard there. That's uncomfortable when everybody's shouting your name there, unless it's uh, Jonathan, you know, our old song leader. That was fun. So, uh, so you got me, man. That was good. He's loving it. That was great. But it, it is, uh, it's great to be together. We're excited to be in our Roman series. Yeah. It's been, it was encouraging to see, even in our song there, to look back and see some different friends here and just new people and everybody coming out. So we're excited yeah. to talk about Romans today. And um, I know, kind of as we get started here, I know Danielle uh, mentioned it in a little more detail with the women's midweek there, but uh, I went to school with Kid. Ketanji Brown Jackson, and uh, she was a year ahead of me at Harvard, and uh, you know, it was good that I was there, because if it wasn't for me, she wouldn't have got through intro to economics. <laughs> that's not true. Uh, that's not true. If, if anybody was tutoring, it would have been the other way around for sure, because I was just trying to figure out what was going on and play football at that time, so... Uh, but uh, my roommate knew her well, and, uh, you know, so I was, like, this close to a famous person. <laughs> and it is an exciting, you know, all, whatever political view she has, uh, I'll put them aside for a minute, but it is a pretty exciting time uh, to be in our country, to have this historic event happen, and uh, to know that I was, like, this close to being her friend uh, <laughs> is pretty cool. But uh, seriously, it is pretty cool. And... To look around and see uh, people, see friends here, to see some OC friends that came here today, it was really cool. So make sure you say hi to them. Uh, and then uh, um, also we've been, this weekend we're happy to have the Alexanders, Jason and Justine and Hannah with us. They're in the back there. And uh, they got the experience of going to the outlet malls today. So uh, that, that was quite an adventure there. I know that he's a sneaker guy, if anybody's a sneaker guy. Uh, I know Mikhail's out camping, or he would be talking sneakers with you, I'm sure, all day. But uh, it is exciting to, to be together. Make sure you get the fellowship, our friends that are here visiting. And today we're going to talk about the crucified king in just a minute. But uh, this was our uh, men's staff meeting this week. And uh, we went out off-roading again. Nelson had so much fun the first time that we got to, at least it was the, the rancho guys and the desert guys. So we went out, and it was, you know, you can tell a lot. If, if you're not an off-roading person, that's okay. You can just kind of, like, not listen for the next couple seconds, about a minute. But, like, when you're off-roading with someone who's never gone before, you find out a lot about their personality, Right, so the first big hill that we came up to, we got all the way to the top, and then we're just about ready to go down. And if you've never done it before, it's like you're, you go over the edge and you don't really see anything until you're like already committed, right? And so we get up to the top of the hill, and then the first thing that happens is Roy gets out of the Jeep, <laughs> right? And he's like, oh, I want to go like look and see what's going on up here. And so I was like, Hey, you had your time earlier. This is my time now. So he, so we both went up and looked, and I went and got back in the car, and then I looked around. We're like, well, Roy never got back in the car, and I see him. He's down the hill, quote unquote, directing because he wasn't sure how safe it was going to be. You told me to get out of the jeep check. And uh, uh, so you know, it was just an observation. You know, I might be wrong. But Roy was a little nervous, and uh, there were definitely uh, some, we had a great time, and um, we found this Easter egg hill, so if you ever want to go somewhere for Easter, that was a cool spot. And we, we found this, like, arch that you could take a pic, that was like a picture arch, and you, I found out a lot about myself right there, because I was absolutely terrified up there, <laughs> trying to be cool, like, walking out on this, like, about as wide as this podium little arch, and trying not to be afraid. And I was just like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> Nelson's up there swinging me around. He's like fearless. He wants to go, you know, probably jump off or something. And Roy's taking the picture. But, you know, it's just a theory. It's a working theory. You can think about it. Uh, and so, 
you know, you learn a lot about your ministers today. There you go. So today we're going to talk about the crucified king. And um, we're going to look at Romans 6 today. And this, this is a really, uh, it's been a, you know, all, you know, as a preacher, you're supposed to be excited about your sermons, right? But this is like one that got extra exciting at different points there. So hopefully I'm going to try to get that over to you. And uh, let's have a prayer and we'll get, we'll get started. Uh, Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for Jesus. I pray that today that we can focus on him in a special way, that for the next few minutes you can open up our hearts to your word. Help us to see Jesus in a new way. Help us to see our life in, in comparison to his in a new way, God. Get me out of the way. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so it's a real simple message today. You will be re- able to remember all of the points. Crucified King. You got it. Okay, that's all you got to remember. The first point is crucified. And we're going to start reading in Romans chapter 6. I'll catch you up on Romans here in just a minute. But it says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We, we, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And he keeps going. He says, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And so this is an amazing passage that talks about, that gives us a picture of baptism and what it is, and it's a beautiful thing. It's when we come into contact with the blood of Christ. It's, it's a, a participation in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's kind of like your wedding day with God, right? So there's a lot of preparation. You're building your faith, and it comes down to this day. And so he's writing it to the Christians here not to explain to them what it is because they've all been baptized, right? He's writing to the church. They've already been forgiven, And he is trying to make some different points there that there was actually people in the church that felt like if God is so forgiving, if you could think about understanding God's grace so well, that he can forgive anything that you do. It doesn't matter. You could be the worst person in the world. You could sin up to the moon and back, and God can forgive you. So some people got the idea that If God's so good at forgiving, then I can just keep sinning, and he's just going to keep forgiving, and he's going to actually get more and more glory because it's going to just make his forgiveness all the greater, so I can just keep sinning. And Has anybody ever struggled with that? (laughs) You know, that's kind of an interesting... As a Christian, I mean, would anybody ever say that out loud? I mean, I'm just going to sin because God's going to forgive me right here, okay? I'm going to look the other way. He's, he, he's cool with me right here. I mean, there's no one that would ever say that, and yet we do say other things to ourselves, like God loves me. You know, God loves me. It's, it's okay. You know, I'm going to Vegas. You know, God loves me, and, you know, it's, he's just going to take care of all this, you know, when I get back. Or maybe when we're not even thinking, we're not really that serious about God, and all I knew growing up was that God has unlimited grace. That was like the entire of my theology. And for me, that's a, that was a pretty good way to think about God, right? He just forgives me, doesn't matter. I was like, man, that's like a golden ticket. You know, it, it doesn't really work that way, but when you're 17 years old, that sounds like a pretty good plan, at least it did to me. But reading through this passage about the crucif- about being dead, it uses the word died, death, buried, crucified, and die again 19 times in this chapter. So it's like, what, this guy, Paul is obsessed with death here in this chapter. I mean, it's just over and over to think about death 
So I have to admit, when I've read this chapter in the past, I kind of like go through the baptism part. I like that part. And then I kind of just like fast forward <laughs> through the rest of it because he just talks about death. I'm like, this is not inspiring me, right? This, is, this isn't really doing it for me. I don't know. Maybe this is your favorite chapter in the Bible. I've been a Christian for a long time, and I still, when I read this chapter, I go, huh, what, why, what is this obsession with death? And then this week, it's like the light bulb came on. You're excited now? Okay, good. Hopefully, I'll be able to. <laughs> the light bulb came on that he wasn't just talking about they had a misunderstanding of what it means to live a crucified life. That it, it's not just about Jesus being crucified, it's about us living a crucified life. That we get to share in Christ in the, 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 the way that he took on sin, and the way that he died to himself, and the way that he helped other people. And we're going to get more into that later, but I want to be able to get you thinking about what does a crucified life look like? Because the resurrection of Jesus began with the cross. The resurrection of our lives begins with our death. If you could think about it that way, dying to the things that God, dying to our old life, maybe you would think about it that way. Dying to the things that control us and make us feel guilty. You know, dying to doing whatever we want, dying to being our own boss in life and making God our boss. That there's a lifestyle of crucifixion that Jesus lived every single day. And I just put the picture here, and I'm going to leave it up there for a little bit, but I couldn't look at this picture for very long. Right? I don't want to look at this picture. Right? So I don't have to because you guys can see it and I really can't. So I'm going to move it. But crucified living, this wasn't just how Jesus died, but it was how he lived. I would put this, that this should be and could be the center of our lives. A crucified life. Jesus, With Jesus at the beginning, I'll get you a different picture to look at. This was the best Easter backdrop of all time during COVID. I, I still love it. I'm actually going to go out there this week and have my quiet time out there because I was just like, man, this is like my spot for Easter. But if you think about Jesus, what does this crucified life look like for Jesus? He, it says that he was a man of sorrows. If you could picture yourself being at the crucifixion of Christ, we would feel that just heaviness. You know, we, we said goodbye, you know, you, a lot of us have been to funerals before. But just that there's that heaviness. Even if they're Christians, there's still that like, oh, this is sad. But that was the way that Jesus lived. When he talked with people, he just grabbed on to their sorrows. And he empathized with people and he cried with people. He wasn't like, rah, rah, God is amazing. I'm so happy all the time. It says that he carried people's sorrows. That was what crucified living was for him. It says he was familiar with suffering. He carried others' burdens. Literally on the cross, he carried our, our burdens. But he made it life better for people around him. He carried them through difficult times. He was the one that people could depend on. He was the one that was there in times of need. And maybe it wasn't life or death times, but it was just times when, man, I need help. Jesus, as we live a crucified life, we get to be that, those people for the world. That we can be people that they can depend on, that we can depend on each other for help. It says he was affected by the sin of the world. Obviously, he was really affected by the sin of the world. But when he looked around the world, his heart broke. He felt people's pain. You know, you ever have those days when you're just like, man, where are we living? 
You know, sometimes we get mad at that, right? We get angry, like, man, this world just stinks, and we just want to get out of here, and God, just take me to heaven. Jesus, like, embraced the difficulty of sin, literally. He took it on himself, in, in himself. I mean, when you ever, have you ever been heavy by sin? I mean, that's a heavy burden when you sin, and you're like, man, I messed up. I can't do it over. It's, it's just there. i got to live with it. I mean, he took on all of that, not just on the cross, but in his life. When he walked in Jerusalem, he just wept. That's what crucified living is. It's, it's not easy to live that way. And yet that was Christ. Why did all the people who were in need come to him? Because he wanted to be there for them. Because he embraced that. He didn't turn away. He had boundaries at times. He said, man, I got to go fill up with God. But he lived a life connecting with other people. Can you imagine Jesus living a life by himself? Just going off and, well, I'm just going to be close to God. And it's like, wow, great for you, man. (laughs) And yet we as Christians, we don't see necessarily our life with each other and with this world. We just think it's, oh, between me and God. I'm just, me and God are great. That's really great, but that wasn't the end of Jesus' life. This crucified life, he was connected to people whether he wanted to be or not. And if he was anything like us, there were times when he's like, God, I'm not ready for this. I don't want to deal with this. I'm not sure I'm up for this. He loved others. Even on the cross, he loved others. He prayed for his enemies. He was righteous and holy. I mean, even when he was dying, he was still concerned for the Pharisees. He was still praying for the soldiers. I mean, that's just righteousness, even when it hurts. Even when he's having the worst day ever, he still cares about being right before God. That's what crucified living is. Just a righteousness that we are so convicted about pleasing God that doesn't matter what's happening around us. And my challenge and encouragement for all of us is to attend your own funeral every day. Every morning, you can go to, you don't have to go all the way up to Landers to go to this cave, but you can put your old life to death. You can put your desires that aren't going with Christ in that cave, and you can close it up every single day. That's what crucified living is. It's not saying that everything is great all the time. That's what Christians do, right? Everything's great. Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, this is the best day ever. Even if it's not. That's not crucified living. That's like positive thinking. Crucified living is like, man, this is bad. This is terrible. This hurts. And I'm giving it to God. Every day, I'm putting it in that tomb. I'm putting that to death with Christ in the hope that he's going to raise me up because it doesn't do any good just to die just for the sake of dying. But when we die, he raises us up. That was Jesus. He went to the cross ready to die because his hope was in resurrecting. Sometimes we even can... That's a whole other thing. Let's, let's look at Jesus and let's challenge ourselves to live a crucified life. Right. One where we embrace difficulty, where we take on other people's challenges, that we give our hearts, that we allow our hearts to even break like Christ. That is not, if you're, I don't know about you, that is not a place I want to go. If you're like, oh, it's going to be a lot of heartache over here, I'm like, well, I want to go over there. (laughs) But if I want to be like Christ, I need to go over here. If I want to follow him, I need to follow him where he went, not where I want him to go. I want to follow Jesus when he walked right through the crowd and they just like fell to the side and he's just like, man, I'm powerful, but not to the cross, which is where he was ultimately going. And I pray that we can 
be inspired by Jesus and how, not just how he died, but how he lived. That he lived with that every day of his life. You know, Roy took care of this part of the sermon for me in the beginning, so that was great. You saved me some time there. But to Jesus coming in as we transition to my second point, which is king, right? So it's crucified king. So you already know what, where we're going here. He says, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It says that the, then he went to the temple and he turned over the tables and the children were exclaiming, Hosanna to the son of David. From the lips of children, I have ordained praise. And so if you can imagine this scene that Roy described, it says that he came near to the place where, uh, near the road of the Mount of Olives. It blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached the city, he wept over it and said, if you only knew on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. This one week, he goes from... And just think about what, who he is. Not just what he did. Not just, you know, he did all these things this week leading up to the cross. But why? What was his heart? What was his mindset? How did he live out this crucified life as our king? And I love this picture with the crown of thorns and the, th and the crown in the same picture. That that was Jesus. He was going to the cross knowing who he was. Knowing that he came from God, he was going back to God. Knowing he was providing a way for us. God just gave him a little encouragement on the way walking down the street on Palm Sunday. Praise Hosanna to the son of David. Only the kids really saw what was happening. So let's look at our second point, the king of kings. I just thought about that donkey. That's not a real glorious entrance, just to let you know. <laughs> he wasn't coming in on a white horse. I mean, it, this is all the pictures I've seen, the donkey's like three sizes too small, you know? So you got this big guy sitting on this little donkey. <laughs> it was a humble entrance. You know, if you picture what they were used to in that time would be the Roman entrance with all the soldiers and all the trumpet blowers and... And here comes Jesus just sitting on a donkey that everybody always portrays as too small. Because he was a different kind of king. Right. In verse 8, he says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lived, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself as to sin or an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. That's the whole point of this, up to here, this point in Romans is that you're under death with the law and now you're under life and grace with Christ. That you were the old Adam that died and was condemned and now you're the new Adam, which is Christ. And you will be raised again with him. It uses the words grace and glory and new life, resurrection, free, raised from the dead and alive. That he's contrasting the death of the old life and the, the power and freedom of the new life in Christ. 
If you could take some time this week to reimagine Jesus. This was kind of a new look for Jesus this, for me this week. It's almost like getting to meet him all over again. Sometimes we get so familiar with all the stories and everything that we forget who he really was. I was reminded of, even in Revelation, we get so caught up in all the details of what's happening and all the horns and riders and kings and craziness that's there that we forget. And I was kind of, that's what was the new thing for me this week is imagining Revelation, but really it's not about all the story of what's happening, even though it, it is, but it's about Jesus. He's given him all these different pictures of Jesus. He goes through this elaborate description of Jesus and his golden sash of kingship and his white hair and his eyes that were blazing like fire. And his feet were like glowing bronze in a furnace. And his voice like rushing waters. And in his hands he had seven stars which we know represents all the churches all the christians that he's he's got them that he has a double edged sword in his mouth and his face shine like the sun i don't really need to know all the other details of revelation but if i can understand this guy i'm going to be just fine that was my, my, my challenge, is to take some time to reimagine Jesus. It's like you can just read through that verse and go, okay, I know what Jesus looks like. Really? Not unless you think about what it's like to have eyes of fire. Think about what it's like to have the rushing waters of Niagara Falls be your voice. It wasn't just meant to tell a story. It was meant to help you to imagine Jesus. Imagine his um, awesomeness that can't even be described. That you could write a tw thousand page book on each different description and not to touch what Jesus was really like. What would your book of Jesus look like? Would it be just all the facts of all the different things that Jesus did? That's, that's one book, but that's not really Jesus. Would it be all the scriptures in the study series, and there we go, that's Jesus, I got it. Or would it be a book where you use your imagination to try to think about and imagine Jesus? And be creative to try to get your mind around his amazing presence. King Jesus. Man, he could spend a long time thinking about King Jesus. If he's their ki the king, then we become the prince and princesses of his kingdom. We gain the rights in, of his inheritance, and we have a gratitude as someone who's come from death to life. I don't know, anybody in here died before? Anybody? Like been flatlined and then brought back? I thought we might have somebody. You know, I'm looking at Chris. I mean, you know. <laughs> Come on, man, you're supposed to help me out here. Can you imagine being brought back to life and not being excited? I mean, it'd be like jumping up and down, running up around the hall, you know, down the aisle and just celebrating. That's what it means to be a Christian. Oh, it's so great. I was born again. <laughs> Got to read my Bible today. Like, man, you no, that's not what it means to be brought back to life. There's a fire that you have when you're alive, when you were dead. You know, Danielle and I have been taking uh, this master's course uh, starting in December, and it's been, it's been really good. It's been a lot of work, but I think 
a couple weeks ago, we had like 30 pages of writing due and all these sources. So it, it can be a little crazy at times. But one of, we, some, uh, somebody said something there, but one of the things that I learned, <clears throat> this is like a real deep thing, so you, I think you'll get it. Love connects to your actions, which then feeds your love. When you love something, you, you do it more and more and more and more and more. And when you do it more and more and more, you fall in love with it more and more and more, so you want to do it more and more and more. So it go, they go together. So you don't have love without actions. When you love something, you, you're passionate. So what was the big revelation? The big revelation were spiritual practices are good. Amen. Spiritual habits are good. Spiritual disciplines, even if those, maybe we don't like that word, those are good things. When we are passionate about God, we want to spend time with him. If you think about you're spending time with God, that's a spiritual discipline. But if that's all it is for you, then you're not someone that went from death to life. That's a passion. That's a love, man. How, how can I spend time with God? When can I go and spend time with him? How can I learn more about this, this amazing word that's life, this gold? No one has to tell me to spend time with him. It's not a, a duty, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a love. And when you spend time with God, then you learn more, and then you love him more. And when you pray and you, you connect with God and you get refreshed, then what do you think it makes you want to do? Never do that again? You're like, oh my gosh, I was, I was so depressed and now God has changed me. I think I want to do that again. The next time I'm feeling a lot, I want to go to God even more so that he can fill me up again. I can be restored. I'm down. I want to be restored. And we do that over and over. And after a while, you go, man, that's a great thing. Why would I not want to go spend time with God? Amen. To worship him. And then when God blesses us, man, God blessed my life. I never want to talk to him again. <laughs> That's crazy, right? He blessed my life. I want to spend more time with him now. Amen. Amen. I want to obey his word even more right now because it worked. Yeah. He blessed me. We spend time with one another and we help one another out. You ever had those times when you just kind of go dump truck on someone? That's what I call it. Just... <laughs> A lot of stuff going on, bro. I just need you to listen for a minute. Boom. And they feel worse, but you feel a lot better. <laughs> and you get to pray together, and you're like, man, what would I have done if it wasn't for that person? I would have had to just kept that to myself. I wasn't able to handle that myself. Or we get encouragement. That, what does that make us do? Does that make you never want to hang out with anyone ever again? No. That makes me want it more. When someone inspires me, that makes me want to hang out with that person even more because it, it, it fuels the love that I already have. When we give to God and he blesses us financially, does that make you want to stop giving? No, it makes you want to test him more. Say, God, okay, you did that. Let's try another one. I want to do that again. You promise you're always going to take care of me. Now it's my faith. Now I'm living that out. I want to do that again. And yet sometimes it can be said, and I, I can even say that I felt this, that Christianity can be like a checklist. Time with God, check. Read my Bible and pray, check. Show up to church, check. Spend time with someone, check. 
give my contribution, set it up automatically. I can just check, 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 check all year long, like Richard said. We already learned from Romans that we're not saved by all these things. It doesn't, you're not going to get points with God. You're not going to get higher status because you're doing these. But right. when you love God, you do these things. Right. You cannot be living for Jesus and not do these things. If you love Jesus, you want to spend time with him. You want to get together with other people that do. You want to follow the scriptures. You want to obey. You want to give. You want to... All these things. And how did I realize this? From you. From you. From those of you who are mature Christians who the last couple years continued to love Jesus and continue to spend time with God and continue to give and continue to pray and continue to worship and continue to get together to help one another and continue to do all the things that people do when they love Jesus. Yeah. That was my revelation this week. All those things are really good. We've even heard them called the five pillars of the Inland Empire. They're good things. When you love Jesus. So my other question is, if we're not doing these things, where's our love for Christ? If we're not reading our Bible, where's our love for Christ? There's a reason why you're not reading your Bible. And you need to figure that out if you want to love Christ. I've talked to people, sometimes they don't want to read their Bible because they don't want to be real about their life. Because when you read your Bible, you got to get real and you got to get honest and you go, man, this stinks. And if I open up my Bible, I got to deal with it. If that's you, then that's a good place to start. God, I don't like my life. Let me look in the Bible and try to figure this out. Let me go yell at you for a while and get it all out. Because I want to love you. I don't want to just get mad. I want to take my burdens and take my stuff to you. You know, I don't know all the reasons why everyone in our church does what they do. I don't know why people don't come. I don't know why people don't give. I don't know why people won't get together with one another to talk about their lives. I don't understand why people don't spend time with God. But there's a lot of us that do. And maybe it's not you. And if it's not you, then amen, that's great. But it's some of us. And this week was kind of a little moment of like, wow, these are the things you do when you love God. And then it kind of clicked like, huh. What does that mean if we're not doing these things? Are we not loving God? Are we needing? I don't know. There, there, there's a story there that God knows. And if you're not participating in these good things, then that's a problem. I don't know what kind of problem, but it's a problem. It's a, it's a relationship problem. It's a love problem. It's a Jesus. I don't know what it is, but if it, that's you, you got to fix that. Because Jesus is the king. He's the one that raised from the dead. He's the one that loves you, and he's the one that is going to hold you accountable too. He's the one that we all will bow down before. And that holiness that is his, that needs to be ours too. That he is the king of kings. I'm going to have to pray for communion here. Kareem, uh, Sammy's uh, son got baptized in uh, Jordan this past week. Amen. He's like 15 now, and uh, it was really amazing. So all their kids are disciples, Amen. all four kids. And uh, this was us when we visited him there. Wow. But that was just a cool time. See, Kareem's in the back with the yellow shirt. He's a little guy there. <laughs> this was Connor and I at the Dead Sea. I don't know why I put that in there, but I did. <laughs> so as we take communion, I want you to reflect 
Those pictures were also a reminder that we have special missions coming up on May 15th. So be praying about that. And thank you for your hearts to support the Middle East. It's going amazing there. We're excited to have people come and share more. But as we take communion, in Romans 6.23, it says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I pray that we can think about our crucified life. Are we, really, are we still crucifying our life? And we could reimagine Jesus. I thought about Jesus as I was doing this lesson, and it made me think of the Beatitudes. And as I read this from the Beatitudes, I want you to picture Jesus on the cross. Right? He, he, he gave this sermon at the beginning of his ministry, but that wasn't really why he was giving. He was giving, this is, this is my life. This is how I live. This is what my life looks like. And you could see that on the cross. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. There was a lot of mourning there, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and even die for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. He died to make peace with God with, for us. Blessed are those who were persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Let's pray and take our communion together. Father, we do thank you for this time. Thank you for an amazing Savior that you've given us. Thank you for Jesus, God. Help us to live our lives, to be with and be like and be near him. Help us to understand what it means to follow him, not just in the, the words and the actions that he did, but in the heart and the why, why he did the things that he did. Help us to know him better. Help us to know what it means to live a crucified life. Help us to reimagine our king and be in awe that our king is, pays attention to us and loves us, God. Thank you for his body and his blood shed for us. I pray you bless us this week as we remember his life, we remember his death, as we look forward to next week celebrating his resurrection. God, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, let's give uh, Scott another round of applause. Well, amen. Let's stand on up and sing one final song, and then we're dismissed uh, for another beautiful Sunday. Uh, I know something that I got out of uh, that lesson is, man, what are, I kind of have to think to myself, and maybe even I have to take some time tomorrow to journal, but like, what are some, what are the three ways that I can live a crucified life? And I know it's going to take a lot of sacrifice, so it's going to take a lot of thinking and maybe even asking advice, but that's what a crucified life is, according to what Scott was talking about and even what we read in Romans 6. Uh, but it's amazing to know that we don't live a crucified life alone, that we bear with one another the same way Jesus thought about other people when he was up on that cross. And so we're going to sing What a Fellowship, and this is really a joyful song, um, but talking about how, man, it's such a joy to be together and worship God together. Amen? So sing. What a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arm Leaning on Jesus Leaning on Jesus Safe and secure from all along Leaning on Jesus Leaning on Jesus Leaning on the everlasting arm Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way Leaning on the everlasting arm Oh, how bright the path goes from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. They fancy good from all along. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Leaning on the everlasting. What have I? What have I to dread? What have I to fear? voices. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all along. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting God. Amen. You guys are dismissed.